Good morning. Well, we're in Luke chapter 3, so please open your Bibles. Our passage that we're going to study this morning is Luke 3, verses 15 through 20. It's roughly in the very middle of uh, Luke's third chapter, and it marks the conclusion of his uh, presentation to us of the life and occupation and conduct of John the Baptist. <clears throat> After this, our gospel concerns itself with the Lord Jesus Christ alone. John the Baptist is what you and I would call a, a great man. His character was exemplary and he accomplished great things in his life. He was faithful to God and he, heard, uh, uh, he held the world loosely uh, to himself. Of course, we would not be alone in that opinion. The one addition Luke offers to his portrait of John is the one found in chapter 7, where he quotes Jesus in verse 28 as saying that among those born of women, there is none greater than John, yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. According to men's mere valuations, John truly was great. But ironically, the most admirable thing about him is that he understood himself and he understood uh, God and his Christ. And in the light of that, he knew he was not great at all. Perhaps you've heard the story of the funeral of Louis XIV of France. In 1715, he died after a reign of 72 years. He had called himself the great, and was the monarch who made famous the statement, I am the state. His court was the most magnificent in Europe, and his funeral was equally spectacular. As his body lay in state in a gold coffin, orders were given that the cathedral should be very dimly lit with only a solitary candle set above his coffin to dramatize his greatness. At the memorial, thousands waited in hushed silence. Then Bishop Massillon began to speak. Slowly reaching down, he snuffed out the candle and began, only God is great. Well, greatness is the theme of our passage this morning. There is the greater one who's coming, his greater baptism he'll bring, uh, the great gospel he will accomplish in himself, uh, sadly, a, a great judgment, and lastly, a great and terrible sin. So let's begin reading in verse 15. Now, while the people were in a state of expectation and all were wondering in their hearts about John as to whether he was the Christ, John answered, the, 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 what we're to understand is he replied back and he said to them, as for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I and I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached the gospel to the people. But when Herod the Tetrarch was reprimanded by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and you know some of you that uh, wicked triangle of, uh, of uh, related people, but the, Herod was reprimanded by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the wicked things which Herod had done, Herod also added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. And then from verse 21 on, uh, Luke turns his attention back to 
his primary subject, John's two, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, sadly, we know from both Matthew and Mark's Gospels what awaited John. He would eventually be beheaded as a consequence of his unyielding stance regarding Herod and Herodias. Luke's already described John's place in the Gospel story and the ministry he undertook. We read and studied those first 14 verses of the chapter in our last lesson. His role was a forerunner. Uh, sent to prepare the way for the coming king. And his message was a call to repentance as the first step toward welcoming him in faith and avoiding the judgment he was preparing to yield. And now Luke subtly shifts his attention to how the people themselves were viewing John. Uh, particularly because of the authority with which he spoke. They were debating among themselves as to whether it could be possible that John himself was the promised Messiah. Actually, they were eager uh, to convince themselves that it was so. They were in a state of expectation. Uh, the New English Bible translates that they were on tiptoe of expectation. Plus, John had emphasized uh, repentance, and there was such a belief in rabbinic thought that repentance was tied to the coming of the Christ that it was said, if Israel repented but one day, the son of David would immediately come. Well, such thoughts were not unknown to John himself, and he quickly moved uh, to dash them uh, before we consider his response in full, it would be good, I think, to consider first uh, the temptations that would have come with such notoriety. It's a very human thing uh, to relish the praise and admiration of other human beings. Uh, flattery uh, from others can be intoxicating and distort uh, one's proper view of oneself. It's very easy to get caught up in it. Uh, but as someone once said, flattery is like perfume. Uh, the idea is to smell it, not swallow it. Well, John displayed remarkable humility when you consider the accolades that were coming his way. Uh, Winston Churchill, who perfected the art of the clever put-down, once described a political opponent as a modest little man who has a good deal to be modest about. <laughs> Well, John was modest, but not because of any shortcomings. Uh, Jesus said he was the greatest man born of a woman, uh, but that only emanated from his true understanding of himself. Uh, William Hendrickson wrote that John was truly great in God's sight, but because he was truly small in his own sight. John wish to express the vast difference. See that word might, mighty, he's mightier. He wanted to express the vast difference between the might of the coming one and himself. Of course, he wasn't thinking of physical strength, but might in every sense of the word. He would be comprehensively mightier than John. Uh, John was not on the same level as the coming Messiah. And he expressed that with an illustration that would have been readily understood in his day, but that requires some explanation for our understanding of it. Teachers in John's day were not paid, uh, but their pupils were expected to show their appreciation by serving them in other ways, effectively almost becoming their slaves. A rabbinic saying from shortly after this period stated that every service which a slave performs for his master shall a disciple do for his teacher except the loosing of his sandal thong. Only a non-Jewish slave could be saddled with so menial a duty, but that is the duty, John said, that compared to Christ, he was, not, he was unworthy to perform. So when tempted to, to drink the perfume or even to smell it, uh, John responded by relegating himself to the position of a servant over against a stronger one who was to come after him. And then to contrast his own baptisms, 
which had stirred up such a fervor among the public with the coming baptism with the Holy Spirit and fire his successor would exercise. Foolish pride and desire for the admiration of those around us is evidence of a disdain for the glory of God. Calvin wrote, God cannot bear with seeing his glory appropriated by the creature in even the smallest degree so intolerable to him is the sacrilegious arrogance of those who, by praising themselves, obscure his glory as far as they can. It is the while of the great deceiver himself to engage us in the very activity that led to his own fall from grace. And when we feel it rising up in our hearts, uh, we must flee to the only one who deserves our praise and admiration and petition him to wrench it away from us and restore to us the proper posture before him. And that's what John the Baptist did. John exhibited the qualities that always accompany the influence of the Holy Spirit upon a person. Think about John. He was, Lucas told us, he was filled with the Holy Spirit while he was still in the womb. He was led by the Holy Spirit in the wilderness for 30 years and then propelled and energized by the Spirit to fulfill his special mission. And that mission, not coincidentally, was the same as the Spirit's mission, to lift up and glorify the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. And that should be our mission as well. Every day, uh, we arise and go forward to meet what waits us for that day. Sometimes it's tedium, uh, sometimes uh, duty, enjoyment, responsibility, certainly. But in whatever we face each day, the spirit would that we have as our overriding purpose to elevate the reputation of our Lord Jesus Christ as we fulfill our daily activities. And John challenges us to take up that posture and wear it every day. That's the evidence of the Spirit's work in a person's life. So consequently, John deflected the crowd's attention to the coming one. Uh, one is coming, he said, who is mightier than I, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John baptized only with water. It was an external ritual that only pointed to a cleansing God alone is able to effect. The baptism of the one who would come after him would be internal by the Spirit and therefore make for a true and real cleansing. It's easy to lose our way uh, when we start talking about a baptism. So we should think carefully about it, and that's what I want to do uh, now. John's baptism was a physical baptism with water. And as we've contended in our study, it followed an individual's decision to repent and commit to the Savior that John proclaimed. The baptism of the New Testament church, our church, is like that in that it is a public display of an inner reality of union with Christ. It follows faith. And every time we see a baptism, uh, Dan will say this very thing. It is a public uh, ritual that uh, is intended to communicate an inner reality. There's a strong element of identification in the ritual of baptism. Uh, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10 of the solidarity of the ancestors of Israel as being uh, all baptized with Moses, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 2. They were publicly identified with Moses to the extent that they partook of the same uh, experiences as him. John's 
baptisms then were intended to identify a company of people who had all adopted the same posture of repentance and expectation of Messiah. But here in our passage, he is maintaining that compared with the baptism Christ himself would accomplish, his was trivial. These great baptisms that were sweeping the land and causing so much talk and elevating his reputation, his baptisms compared to Christ were trivial. So what is this baptism he speaks of that the Messiah will bring about with the spirit and fire? One is coming, this is what John says, one is coming who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. We must assume that when Jesus came, he did that. He baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. Well, first, we must note that there are two ways to understand that statement. Uh, one is that the fire of the baptism is what will characterize baptism with the Spirit. And if we take it that way, then fire stands for purification. It's used that way in the scriptures, and I will illustrate that in a moment. The other possible interpretation is that his baptism will have two components. Messiah will baptize with the Spirit, and he will baptize with fire, uh, generally thought to be the fire of judgment. Now, this second view uh, is difficult, however, because the two components are governed by only one preposition. You were hoping we'd have a grammar lesson, but the two are, are governed by this one preposition, making it more accurate to translate it, as in my version, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, and not he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. In spite of that difficulty, though, an argument can be made that that was what John meant. For one thing, the theme of judgment is in uh, the context. Uh, John has just warned in verse 9 that the axe is already laid at the foot of the trees, and the bad trees will soon be cut down and thrown into the fire. And in the verse that follows this one, verse 17, he'll speak of burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Also, it is true that when Jesus came, he did, in a sense, divide the world into these two categories, those who believed in him and were baptized in the Spirit and those who rejected him and could be said to have been baptized into judgment. And he would return one day for judgment. Now, it's easy to get bogged down here. I don't want to see your eyes rolling back in your head, but... Uh, whichever way you interpret it, that way or the way I'm going to posit, uh, all of it's true. All those things are true. But I tend to think that John was expressing instead how Jesus would enact a baptism that would be characterized by the coming and regeneration, regenerating work of the Holy Spirit and also by the ensuing sanctifying work of the Spirit in purifying the believer as figuratively fire purifies. And we find that usage uh, commonly in the scriptures. First example, Isaiah 4 verse 4, he prophesies of a future day when a remnant will be preserved who will have their filth washed away by the Lord in a spirit of burning. You can look that up later. In Malachi 3, you know this verse, asks the question, who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a smelter and purifier of <coughs> silver and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. You know, for centuries, uh, refiners of metal have heated metal with intense fire so that it melted and the impurities would rise to the top, the dross, and uh, they would take that dross off so that what remained 
was of the purest quality. And that's the imagery that John is using here, applied to the work of the Spirit. And I bet you we'll see something similar to this at the 1030 service in Dan's opening message out of James chapter 1. You know it, many of you have it. We should consider it all joy, right? When we encounter these various fiery trials of life because the result in believers will be perfect, lacking in nothing, perfect and complete. It's what the hymn writer was thinking when he penned his song. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. So I think that was what John was describing, this picture of both the positive and negative aspects of the work of the coming one. Those who repent and receive him will find themselves purified as with fire, but also receive uh, the multiple and untold blessings of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But in understanding this, it will help us even more to go to another passage of scripture. And that's Romans chapter six, verse three, where we'll see that Messiah's baptism by the spirit is closely connected to our baptism into Christ himself. So we're wanting to know what John meant by this, that Messiah will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And here in Romans 6, verse 3, we have direction where Paul wrote, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into death? into his death. That is, we were spiritually united with Christ. That's what that means. He goes on, therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. That's what baptism, physical baptism pictures, going under the water and dying with him, coming out and living with him in newness of of life. So this is the great truth of our union with the Lord Jesus Christ, our total identification with him that changes us. It changes us into the new creatures that we believers are. In James Boyce's expositional study of Romans 6, he did a word study. He was big on word studies. He did a word study on a bapto, uh, the Greek word meaning to dip, and baptismo, uh, the more intensive verb, meaning to completely immerse. Bapto to dip, baptizo to completely immerse. And he found that the second word, baptizo, uh, almost always pointed to a change having taken place by some means, and he found a good illustration of that out of a text from the Greek poet Nicander who lived about 200 BC. It's a recipe for making pickles, and it's helpful because it uses both words. Nicander says that to make a pickle, uh, the vegetable, or the cucumber, or whatever, uh, should first be dipped, bapto, into boiling water. Haven't tried this and then baptized, baptizo, in a vinegar solution. And so both words concern immersing, but the first is only temporary, and the second, baptismo, baptizo, produces a permanent change. It makes it a pickle. Well, this helps, I hope, helps us to understand what John was indicating by Messiah's baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Sorry to throw a bunch of verses at you, but in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, Paul says this, for all of you were baptized into Christ. All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. We have clothed ourselves with 
with Christ. This is how we're to understand this. The baptism of the Holy Spirit outfits us, outfits us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Both John the Baptist and the writers of the New Testament often resorted to these figures of speech to express spiritual realities. And so this is another way of saying that by the Spirit, we were united with Jesus. We have clothed ourselves with him. And Jesus, too, uh, more so, uh, often used figurative terms in order to express spiritual truth. In John chapter 3, in his interview with Nicodemus, he used mixed figures. Uh, First, he told him he had to be born again if he was going to see the kingdom of God. And then he talked about the wind uh, as a picture of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit accomplishes that new birth. You have to be born again. What's that mean? Well, the wind blows, and that's how the Spirit accomplishes that new birth, accomplishes regeneration. The miracle of the new birth by the Holy Spirit, we might say, is the initiatory experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In another verse, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul speaks in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. This is his initiatory work, and every true believer has experienced that baptism. Of course, there are other blessings that go along with uh, being baptized in the Spirit. You know them. We're permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He lives in us. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. We belong to him. We're taught by him. We're prayed for by him and relentlessly supported by the Spirit and putting to death the deeds of the flesh. We call that mortification. And all of this was illustrated finally in the experience of the early church on the day of Pentecost. Think about it. In Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit of God suddenly rushed into their meeting and they were all filled with the Spirit, remember? John had said that one was coming who would baptize them with the Holy Spirit and fire. And there in that room on that day, the Spirit came and tongues as of fire appeared, distributing themselves and resting upon each person, a visible expression of what John had proclaimed and promised. What that means for you and me today is that we have the Spirit of God indwelling us, empowering us to conform us to the image of Christ. He is changing us by purifying us. It may not look that way every day, but he's doing that. He's changing us by purifying us and thus growing us up into the mature believer. Having baptized us by the Spirit, as we were reminded in our recent study in Galatians. And as we walk in the Spirit and keep in step with the Spirit, we can be assured that we'll be walking in His steps, as Peter said in 1 Peter 2.21, the steps of the coming one that John proclaimed. Well, that's more time probably than you thought we'd spend on that that one verse. But it's an important verse and an important spiritual truth for us to understand. But John didn't stop there. The one who is coming will not only bring with him a greater baptism, he will also bring a great judgment. Verse 17 His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Masses of people, we're told, came out into the wilderness to hear John preach, to watch him baptize, to be baptized, 
He couldn't have known who of these many who came were sincere, uh, whose repentance was true, but the coming one knows the heart of every individual. His discernment is perfect, and therefore his judgment is perfectly discriminating. And John uses another figure out of the everyday lives of his listeners to express this great judgment. Uh, the reference is to a, a typical harvest time when all the grain is brought in from the fields and uh, the oxen pull the, the sled on top of it to separate the grain from the stalks. And, and then the winnowing uh, begins and the harvester takes up the winnowing fork or the winnowing a uh, uh, shovel, and he tosses the grain up into the air, and, and the, the, the dusty little pieces that don't belong, the, the straw and, and, and things, are, are carried away by the wind. He's chosen a place where there's a breeze, and he throws it up in the air, and the grain falls to the ground, and the chaff is blown away. And then, of course, uh, it leaves only the ground, grain on the floor, which he then takes the grain with the chaff separated and stores it carefully in his barn. The, ch the chaff, meanwhile, has accumulated. They sweep it up into a pile and the harvester sets a match to it so that it burns up and is dispensed of. And the picture is of the discriminating judgment of God. And isn't it remarkable? It was remarkable to, to me when I worked on this. Isn't it remarkable how the scripture set before us these various and diverse examples of that discriminating nature of the Lord? There's the parable of the wheat and the tares. They're all mixed together, remember, in the, in, the, in the field, and the Lord lets them grow that way, lets them grow up together until harvest time. And then he gathers in the wheat and he destroys the tares. There's the judgment of the sheep and the goats. The sheep are set over to one side and the goats to another. And the king, before whom the sheep and the goats have gathered, says to the sheep, come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But the, to the goats, he says, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. The images are one and the same. The grain is lovingly taken to the father's farmer's barn. The wheat, the same. The sheep brought into their inheritance. And this reflects, all three images reflects how, the pre how precious the elect are to their heavenly father. But the chaff, the tares, and the goats, oh, how terrible is the fate of those who have not been brought to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. John says the chaff will be burned with unquenchable fire. The tares, we read, are bound into bundles and they're burned up. The goats enter into eternal punishment in the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Unquenchable is what John says. Unquenchable, the, the word stands for eternal, ultimate judgment where and I've pulled these verses from various places in the Bible where their worm never dies, their shame is everlasting, the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever so that they have no rest day or night, no rest day or night. It's hard uh, to find these verses and, and read them and, then, and teach them because they, they paint a truly horrid picture. And that is the reason not to ignore them, to, but to put the very same emphasis on them as Jesus himself did. It's grace to preach and to teach hell. It's mercy to proclaim it. And surprisingly, perhaps, it's 
a part of the gospel itself. That's what John indicates to us in verse 18. Luke, Luke writes, with many other exhortations, he preached the gospel to the people. You read this along in the, in the Greek text and, and you see it, it stands out. That Uangelizo, he, he preaches the gospel. This is the gospel that John was preaching. One day Christ will come and set things right. Uh, we are not right. Uh, we've been cleansed. Our sins have been forgiven on account of the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross. But things are not right. We rejoice in our salvation. Still, we know that things are not right. The world is not just, but evil. That psalm that Dan brought before us last Sunday, Psalm 98, uh, concluded uh, with this profound thought. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy before the Lord. For he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. And we should order our lives in expectation of his coming again, uh, heeding the promptings of his spirit in whom we have been immersed. We've been baptized with the spirit and fire. Our passage ends in verses 19 and 20 with a quite terse account of John's ultimate earthly fate. The other synoptic gospels provide a fuller, of count, a fuller account of how the evil Herodias plotted to have John the Baptist beheaded. Most of us have studied those accounts several times over. In addition to all else, John was courageous and zealous for righteousness, and he would not back down from condemning the behavior of Herod and Herodias and their incestuous and adulterous relationship. It was Herod's great sin. God did not intervene to spare John's life. The things we do to serve God and honor him are not always known. They do not always meet with what might appear to be a good end. Profound humility, like John's, is not always rewarded in the here and now. But God is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him, as the author of Hebrews wrote. My dad was a humble man. He was no John the Baptist, but he was a humble man who loved the Lord and, and was faithful to him. And on the day that he went to be with the Lord, it was a Sunday, and I was sitting in the auditorium over there listening to Dan. And he was preaching on 1 Corinthians chapter 4, where in verse 5, Paul warned, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait, wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. And Dan remarked in his sermon, how wonderful, how wonderful to think that one day God might actually praise us. It's hard to believe. One day he might actually praise us. It comforted me later that week to contemplate that as it related to my father. But just think how the greatest man born of women enjoyed his praise. He was great before the Lord. He was the last prophet and he pointed all who would listen to Christ. May we have an ounce of his DNA in us.
Lord, thank you for this man that you sent, your servant, you elected him, you anointed him, you brought him into being miraculously, and he pointed us to Christ. His whole life was centered around uh, bringing people to a saving knowledge of the Son of God. Uh, give us uh, a dose of that, Lord, we pray. Uh, more and more may we have it uh, in our hearts, uh, in, in our determination uh, to lift up Christ, to lift him up to those around us, to be bold in sparing them the horrible judgment that could come to, that will come to all those who are not found in him. We pray that in his name. Amen.